There was someone I forgot to introduce last time. This is Saburo. She is a former member of TAN, which Pi has contacted to keep eyes on Tappy and Haseo, continuing the surveillance they lost because they never learned why Ovan was after the pair. Gee, it's almost as if having a guild with a bunch of minions who could order to do things would have been a good idea instead of abandoning the lot of them and leaving a businessman to hold your dirty laundry. To be honest, I actually kind of like Saburo, and it's because of all her creative metaphors that are pretty much awkward tangents that, somehow, are still on topic with the subject of discussion. And also because she irritates the crap out of Pi. And I do not like Pi at all. Even better, she approaches the job in a direct and unsubtle manner, approaching Tabby first before thankfully learning the girl is a twit and being sent in to watch Haseo back in the Forest of Pain. While Haseo is additionally indignant, he needs the help and never bothered to learn any of the basic healing spells to supplement his item supply as they travel deeper in. And then Tabby's I-don't-know-what-to-do subplot takes over most of the rest of the arc. Admittedly, this does have connotations for the games. See, this is Seisaku. He and his friend Hideo would become the founding members of the newbie and intermediate support guild, the Medic Union, who would go to various areas and heal up any players they come across, be they casuals or PKs. It's actually one of the guilds the various PKs don't screw with, as the service is open to anyone, and even they need to heal every now and then. Having them marked and refused for such a service would only make things tougher on them in the long run. Here, however, Seisaku finds himself attracted to Tabby, and that subverts his will into being a minion through this arc. Barely training to boost their levels, as Tabby either leads them onto things they are terribly underleveled for, or wastes their time with either frivolities or moping. Granted, that doesn't start for another three episodes after this. Haseo and Saburo encounter Taihaku, and the three briefly chat before moving on. Saburo, wanting to see the end of the field and not caring about her orders, follows Taihaku for a bit, before Pai calls her out, as she has also been monitoring Haseo's progress. Then why did you send her in there if you were just going to do it yourself? Taihaku finds the end of the dungeon first it bearing a sword in a stone, Haseo likewise finding it much later, as time is about to run out. Though before that is Saburo continuing her rebellious streak and giving up a bunch of items to Haseo before he exits the dungeon. Anyways, after drawing the weapons, the PC is teleported before a familiar being. An AI copy of Harold Horwick. I shall ask you a question. Hmm? Is my daughter safe and sound? And this is how the two greatly differ, and the rewards they receive as well. Taihaku's is polite, wishing that she is well despite never meeting her. And Haseo's is antagonistic, by proxy being struck down from the realm. Taihaku's reward is a weapon of unparalleled ability, and Haseo's... is raw, mind-consuming power, having been forcibly upgraded into his third form, all of his jobs unlocked. I mentioned this before, an adept rogue's true power lies in job extension, where the user gains access to a second and possibly third weapon to gain proficiency in. They are usually given out as the rewards to special quests, but no one in this goddamn anime does the game quests. But while Haseo's gained something, Harold has also taken something in exchange, and what was taken was far, far more valuable than any power he could have been given. Nineteen is more filler. Oh, don't we just love that in this part of the show? It does return an old character, though, Taoraya's player, now using a PC named Tota, who logs on and finds the in-game economy has been thrown completely out of whack by a group of players who are running a pyramid scheme to inflate the in-game prices to the point that desperate players will break the user license agreements and spend real-world money to get in-game currency. Whoever devised this episode was obviously a player of World of Warcraft at some point, as Lord knows, the only way to get proper currency in that game for the mandatory extras 
is with real-world money exchange. The world has never really needed that, mainly because in the past they had merchant guilds like TAN or direct trading. But with TAN's collapse, it allowed some less than scrupulous high-level PCs in to manipulate the system. Toda encounters Pi and recognizes Ender's mannerisms, passing along a message to monitor him. As he enacts a plan that gets a lot of the real-world traders to panic, attack some of Tan's remnants that are running a small shop, and their best customers cash in wool. This is actually one of the episodes I liked, because 1. No fucking tabby anywhere to be seen. 2. It was well-paced, not wasting time, and wrapped all its subplots in its runtime, something no other episode has managed to do. 3. It dealt with a manner that is still a real problem in MMOs with respect to in-game resources and currency balance. And 4. It brought back one of the original characters from this anime that had any form of depth. Yeah, Tawaraya didn't have much to him, a gamer having fun as an information contract and businessman, but you felt sorry for him because the pair he trusted as the other guild heads left him holding an empty bag. It wasn't like he was ever an outright asshole, even when he was manipulating the sides of the brigade. He was just playing options and being honest when called on it. I actually wanted to see Tota brought over to the games after this, but at the end of Roots, he leaves to go study abroad. Which would actually have been a better way to isolate Haseo, as he is at the beginning of Rebirth, abandoned in favor of his friends and allies living their own lives, or becoming disinterested due to how the player killers Haseo antagonizes start to strike at him through his connections. Show them falling apart not because he shunned what he needed, but by his journey forcing him to lose them, and becoming bitter about it until everyone else is gone. Alone, becoming more and more driven to save Shino, as he's the only one left that's trying, and that motivation slowly driving him insane as he continues to fail to find anything that would lead him to Triage, to the one who took her from him, to the one that may have an answer that can bring her back. True the one he will slaughter ally and enemy alike if they refuse to tell him where he is. But no. For the next several episodes, he just acts like a bestial antagonistic asshole. You know, there is actually an in-game term for a player that hunts other players for no other reason than to hunt them. Chaotic PK. I mentioned these people before, as Chaotics are the most infamous of the player killers, the lowest of the low seen amongst the non-PK player community, with not only the highest kill count among them, but each having a signature call sign or quirk to them that they will announce or show just before attacking and killing a player. And Haseo's is... Do you know Triage? And that's not who we should be following. We should be following the man who hunts PKs because he believes one of them has access to something they shouldn't that caused Shino's coma. A man who is protecting others by taking down those who see death as a game while he searches for clues. A player killer killer. We see that in the games. Hear it as Haseo's the undying legacy, as the man who began the battle to take back the game from these self-absorbed assholes who take pleasure by preying on others by teaching them the terror of death they have so abused. Here, he's just a moody jackass that will cut anyone down if he so as much breathe improperly in his direction with no reason given why he started hunting the PKs. You couldn't give us anything? Anything about why he decided to attack PKs and players alike? Instead of asking for information? Building a network like through Philo, who wanted him to find a better way than just blind attacking. Hell, Philo won't even talk to him anymore when he's like this. I probably wouldn't have as much an issue if, again, the emotional elements that formed his crusade had not been so catastrophically screwed up. Or, an explanation of why he's a little more than an animal now in the game, when before he entered the forest, he was fine. I wouldn't have even cared if the explanation was Harold screwing with his head when he gave him the upgrade, as we know the black box files were meant to collect details about human aspects, and personality to create stable conscious beings. The fact that the software is damaged now could mean Harold screwed up, but there is no explanation. Tabby approaches Haseo, wanting to help, 
like she should have done months ago. And yes, it has been months now since Shino was PK'd. But like I said earlier, Tabby is an idiot, and at past experience has already told Haseo that she can neither be trusted nor relied upon. Yatsa and Pai devise a plan to use Sauro's PC as a way to make Haseo react violently to a betrayal. The betrayal via them taking it over and doing something to evoke the response. But Sauro, having figured out part of their game, outright refuses, going to Haseo to silently fill him in while cutting ties, attacking him herself. And her attacks do nothing. For Haseo's level has reached up into the hundreds, beyond most of the players. But he is reminded both of his gifts and that someone has encountered Triage and dealt with him. Where's Triage? Triage is gone. You have to forget about him. How am I supposed to let him go? And that is the crux of the matter. Haseo cannot move on. Not until she's back. Not until what they built can be back. Which would be really emotional and heart-wrenching and get us to empathize with the monstrous things he is doing. If we had seen that happen. If we had gotten that investment. That interaction between them. But we don't. From what we have solely from this is that Saseo has become a sociopath after the woman he stalked became beyond his reach. This could have sent Haseo beyond the edge, but Toda brings him back, offering to rebuild his old information network to help him when Fila won't. Though apparently, Triage is not as gone as Fila would have liked Haseo to believe. Episode 21 opens on the wrecked PC of Midori warping into Makanu having seen the battle that apparently took down Triage. Midori is actually another character that gets better treatment elsewhere. Sadly, not in the games, but in her own spin-off trilogy of novels, called Dot Hack Cell, which I will be reviewing when I do all of the second era novels. Though I still need copies of the second and third books at the time of this recording. Anyways, Haseo hears about this and of her in-game business. She's a professional victim, offering a service where the customer has one minute to try and hit her as she dodges. I'm probably explaining it badly, but it's pretty much her drawing PKs to her by actually offering them a reward for trying to kill her. And her business only booms when she popularizes herself as Triage's only surviving victim. Philo had never made public his escape. And naturally, Haseo targets her. First through her business, and later when he finds out she held out on him key details. Well. Held out is probably the wrong phrase, as she mentally blocked out parts of the fight from her memory, for reasons better explained in the novels. And those blocked out details include how Triage fights, and who fought him. For Midori, despite her wrecked state, was only a witness to the actual battle. Saburo, having ensured Haseo won't be tricked if her PC is used on him in Pai's intended method, offers the character back only for Pi to be driven up the wall with the girl's metaphors. And now she's free to play as she will, cutting ties with her. What a brat. Oh, Saburo, like you would not believe. So Haseo fights Midori all out, but despite his advanced level, Midori's sheer skill with her character allows her to easily outclass him, being the only person ever to defeat Haseo in fair combat. But this shows something else that Haseo has refused to recognize. If Midori, who barely survived being a spectator to a battle with Triage, can kick his ass, then what chance does he have on his own? Sadly, with his current madness and being regularly accosted by Tabby and her worthlessly low-level recruits, what chance does he have of finding an ally that can keep up, even if he would consider it? And yes, worthless recruits, as Tabby's pawpaw squad not only fails to do their job in being a support team for low-level adventurers, they don't even notice the core of their problem, thinking it's how they posed at their introduction, as if they were a freaking Sentai team where the roll call is part and parcel with the freaking powers. Fortunately, Toad is around to set them aright. What do you mean you can't help it? Go out and raise your levels at once. STUPID! YOU'RE SO STUPID! This is again the problem I have with Tabby. She mopes about doing nothing, and when she finally does do something, 
she screws it up on the most fundamental of levels. And Toda rightfully chews them out for that. Pi approaches Kuhn with a job offer to join them, for reasons I'll get into in the game reviews, saying the following. Your player character is potentially dangerous. You can cause trouble when you involve those around you. This will lead to a running misconception that will lead to a host of bad things. All because Pi wanted to manipulate someone on an emotional level. She never seems to learn this is, in fact, a bad thing. And every time she tries it, it inevitably leads to worse things. Anyways, with that on his mind, Kuhn goes to have one final adventure with his guild, who will be important in the games, and end up helping Tabby's group actually get through a dungeon that should have been ridiculously easy for them to clear. Really, he's only running from his responsibilities. Oh dear god, the face! The face! <laughs> yes, this is another one of Haseo's victims, and the player killer community has had enough of it. With his obvious obsession with Triage, they leak out that someone figured out Triage's pattern of attack, and the next likely area of his appearance. It's a trap! Oh, Admiral Akbar, like you would not believe. And it backfires. Big time. The trap consists of over 100 player killers flooded into an area, attacking him with as many as they can at a time. And Haseo slaughters them. From this battle, in May of 2017, Haseo would not only earn his reputation as the most ruthless player killer in the game, especially because among the victims are Tabby and her pawpaw squad, but also his signature moniker, the Terror of Death born months ago by an unknowing pair of PKs that just saw an inexperienced babe, has finally taken his title. Scarred into the face of the world, with the blend of all of the bodies that fell in that field. Amusingly for me, the organization of the whole thing was done by a character we will learn to love to hate, Bordeaux. You may remember her from when Gorn killed her to claim a virus core, and her reasoning is pretty sound. Either the Legion of PKs finally does Haseo in, or she and her team will be all the more famous when they take him down. It's win-win. Yeah, how did that work out for you again? <laughs> yeah, me thinks you should have helped out your pawns there, Miss... My name is a city in France known for its wine. The fight does happen in the anime as well, but it's another one of those scenes that is one, better in the damn games that it's supposed to be a prequel to, and two, not shown in its entirety because of that. Anyways, in the aftermath of the battle, Haseo gives a final warning to Tabby. Don't ever follow me again. 24 through 26 conclude the series while overlapping with the games at last. Hasao having become the infamous player killer dubbed the Terror of Death, as I said, the mere sight of him in towns causing the common players to flee, and Tabby lost again as Seisaku and Hideo have abandoned her to start the medic union like they wanted to originally. Saburo coming across her and saying what I have this entire time. Okay, what about you? Huh? Me? Haseo's doing something for Shino. What are you doing then? <sighs> hmm. Well then, you're not doing anything, huh? Philo confronts Haseo about his fresh title, asking if this is what Shino would have wanted from him. Knowing what I do about the series, it could honestly go either way. There are more events that happen, but since they're actually shown in the games and not in the anime, I'll skip to the important bits. Ovan is back, and reveals Triage will appear where Shino fell, luring Haseo to Hul Grands. Saburo, having learned that Haseo regularly visits there, but not knowing the reason, she thinks it's something along the lines of praying, thus has a front row seat, to the battle of the Terror of Death and the PC that looks like Kite. But the outcome has long been decided and forewarned. Haseo loses. Saburo relates the event to Tota, not able to understand what she saw. And with Haseo's PC trashed by the incident, rumors spread about his disappearance, 
though none of those who know Haseo are that worried. But Philo has other things in his mind, asking Toda to do something for him after he leaves. See, the entire time Haseo has known him, Philo has been dying, an operable cancer, and he chose to spend his last days in an MMO, trying to dispense wizened information from his long life and help those younger than him who might have needed it, while enjoying himself in a realm where his body was not tearing itself apart. And he gets Ovan to tell him his secret, which he shall take to his grave. Kuhn comes across his former guildmates, asking them to look for and take care of Haseo if they happen to come across him. Something that ends up becoming a huge continuity flaw if this is taken to be canon. And sure enough, Tota eventually finds Philo's PC, but not controlled by the man who was Philo. And on that day, Haseo returns to the world. His character data resets. Everything he had gone. All of that, and no closer to saving Shino. Though he's gotten one thing back, his sanity, no longer acting like the crazed lunatic he was when in his former form. Tota finds him and takes him to Arca Colm, to tell him of what happened to Philo, which makes Haseo regret not listening to the man who tried so hard to make him listen. Remember this. Whatever happens, you have to stick to your guns. That's Vila's message to you. Yada tracks an anomaly that has taken his and Pi's attention from Ovan, sending her and Kuhn after it, which we will get to in the games. Toto gives his farewells as he's finally heading out, as surprisingly so is Tabby, finally quitting long after she should have. But before she does, she does manage to track down Haseo one last time, to tell him where she's going. She's decided to become a nurse, and see if she can't help Shino in the real world, while Haseo presumably quests for a way within the world. Forgetting, of course, that it takes a lot of time to be certified as such, and there's no guarantee she'll be assigned to where Shino is holed up if she does stay in the hospital that long. And so finally, truly alone, does Haseo have a choice. To stop here and let it become someone else's problem to solve, live his own life, and cut ties with the world, or begin anew, without allies, his level reduced to one, his powers, rare equipment and abilities reduced to worthless bites of data, and enemies made of every major faction, to once again search for his nemesis and a way to bring Shino out of her coma. This is where I always came, when I was about to begin something new. And Haseo takes that first step once again. For he is Ryo Masaki the player that was once Sora the Betrayer, bound in Scaith's wand. And he will not lose again. Now, it's clear. The roots of the path have been laid and ended. Now begins the rebirth. This series is not good. At all. I've said its problems repeatedly, but let's go over the big ones again for the recap. The pacing is horrendous, and acted as if they didn't know what the hell they wanted to do with its runtime, often spending minutes of an episode just letting the soundtrack play, or repeating plot points or scenes from previous episodes without purpose. This did happen in Cyan on occasion, but it was always keeping things moving. They didn't waste time, and much of the filler was used to develop one or more of the main cast as characters. The show moved with purpose and focus. Here, you don't get why Shino was obsessed with Ovan, or Haseo with Shino. You don't get the dignity, the simmering rage, or an emotional connection with the characters for each other or the audience. You don't understand Tan's motives, or why Ovan's considered a nut for wanting to find the key. And yes, that's a mystery specifically left out until the games, as his reason is a central driving force behind his actions throughout. To be honest, the best episodes, and closest it came to being on science level of storytelling, were episodes I mostly just quick summarized because their lack of importance in the arc. Tabby is a terrible character, and yet she is the one that ends up with the most collective screen time, especially in the last half of the show when we should have been focusing on Haseo's obsessive journey to save Shino that made him the terror of death. That's what this series should have been about laying the roots of why he does what he does, 
why he would go to the extremes he reaches in the games, and why the people here would have such a big impact to inspire his later actions. But there's no emotional investment to get us there. We just have people who talk. And this isn't that bobbing heads thing where it's snappy comebacks, ritty repartee, or commentary on the human condition. It's all stuff we could have seen happen. Instead, the main character is often waylaid for pointless antics, while we should have been shown the descent into madness he has to be saved from. Kind of think of it, who was actually important to the continuing tale of GU? Haseo certainly is, as is Ovan. Yana and Pai, who will be explained finally in the games to the detriment of all the plot holes that are now invoked, and pretty much contradicted in the anime. Kun and Taihaku, despite being seen in only three episodes or so. Midori, but only in her own spin-off novel. Kennard, which barely got in screen time, and the Menic Union, which has never appeared in Roots, actually. Philo's influence will be seen at most twice more as he tries to leave someone who will look out for Haseo. And of course, the kite-like PC called Tri-Edge. But the people that did get a lot of focus? Saki Saka? Gorn? Beset, Saburo, Tawaraya slash Toto, and his merchant friends, the Fabric siblings, and especially Tabby? Not a bit. We got jerked around for 26 fucking episodes. I wouldn't have minded them much as supporting characters. As I said, I really liked Toto. But when there was a story to tell, and there was supposed to be one, they ultimately came up as pointless additions. And here is the big secret to why I've been so nasty towards this stupid series. Before working on this review, I had never watched Roots. Never. Not once. Why? Because there was absolutely no reason to. The GU Trilogy, hell, even the movie called Trilogy, tells the important parts of the story which were supposed to be shown in this anime so well you could skip the entire thing and not miss a single important moment. For that is Root's biggest sin. You waste 26 episodes thinking you would get some special insight into the beginnings of the characters you see, and grow to love, and care about what happens to him at the end, only to have nothing for sitting through it. And G.U., what it ties into pretty much ignores almost everything but the big bullet points in this. In that respect, it is worse than Legend of the Twilight Bracelet. The other lack of relevance to the story told when you look back on it. Legend failed because the story they told was utterly stupid and went against the characters shown in the source material that they could have laid in waiter to adapt in full. Roots is a prequel that makes you not care about the journey taken through the games it's supposed to be a companion to. I don't think the intent was bad, and in some respects tried to be different than Sign. I have said several ways this series could have been better, made relevant to what would later happen. But as it is, it's just a waste of time. And as a final shot at the failings of the show, the last scene, instead of long after crossing into the game's events in episode 23, in which actually conflict with the timeline, should have been one of two things. Haseo's loss against Triedge, or the moment he first logs back in after that, deciding within himself to keep moving forward and not meandering about as it was done for two episodes. So yeah, ignore the crap out of this anime. Do not hunt it down, it is a waste of 12 hours of animation. But if you think because Roots sucked, nothing good came out of the GU project, trust me, you're not begun to see its true glory. As we open the Gate of Utopia with Dot Hack Rebirth, this has been Dot Hack Retrospective. I'm Des Shinta. See you all next time.